much. Um, as uh, Christian said, uh, my name is Wiesław Mzielka, I'm from the university. I'm also a participant of the Green Carbon Project. And the topic of today's presentation, can I minimize that? Yes, um, and the topic is the practical basis of CSD modeling of the pyrolysis of the single particle of wood, yeah, which is quite long. It's going to be an introduction and examples for non-computer science researchers. What does that mean? That means that I will not go into the details uh, from the computer science angle, yeah, but I would rather focus on the detail which is closer um, to my personal field, which is chemical engineering. And from this angle, I will explain this uh, whole, model, whole modeling shenanigan. Um, but first thing first, uh, the presentation has two parts because I had like additional time. So I prepared, I prepared something more. Um, so the part, first part is uh, going to be the biochar basics, yes, uh, which I'm going to give you a brief uh, introduction into the pyrolysis for those who don't know, who is not very, very that familiar in the field. And then I will just say a few words about the biopolymers degradation, then the biochar production application, and its dependence on the properties. Um, I will focus a bit more on the positive distribution and its implications because it's one of the most crucial parameters in terms of the biochar. And then I will say a few words why we don't have the novel solution yet, novel, novel solutions yet, why we don't using biochar uh, at the current day. Then I will go to the second part uh, of the presentation, so is D, modeling. Uh, briefly about the profits uh, from the modeling, why, why it's useful, why, why, why we really bother with that. Uh, then uh, I will explain the framework of the comp comprehensive modeling of the biomass conversion and the CFD, uh, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, then the details uh, about the CFD, so we're going to start from the geometry and meshing. Then governing equations, input parameters and solving the equations. And on the end, the simulation product, so what we, go, what we can get from the model and how reliable it is. Uh, so let's begin from the first part, now with the first part, uh, Biotra Basics. So if we would, uh, if we would look on the pyrolysis process, uh, on, on the biomass conversion processes, we can divide it, we can divide them by the conversion, Hello? You have to share your screen again, I guess. Yeah. I think what, hap what happened? Uh, just a green button in the middle. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So, yes. from the beginning. Uh, so, uh, if we would like to divide the thermochemical conversion processes, we can divide it firstly by the con uh, conversion environment. So if we have like excess of oxygen, it's going to be a combustion of the biomass. Then if the oxygen content in the environment is, is reduced, we call it gasification. So the products uh, of the conversions are not on the highest level of the oxidation. And then there are the processes which do not contain oxygen in the conversion environment. So these are the pyrolytic and hydrothermal processes. Then we can divide them by the medium in which um, process takes place. So if it's liquid, so the water or organic solvents, it's a hydrothermal processing. And if uh, the environment is, is in the gaseous phase, uh, in, in inert gases, we call it the pyrolytic processes. And then the pyrolytic processes, we can divide by the temperature of the process. Uh, firstly, um, by the mild pyrolysis, which is called Torification, which take place between uh, 200 and 300 degrees, and mostly focus on the degradation of the hem hemicellulose and and uh, and nothing else than that. And then we have a D pyrolysis, which take place between 300 and 700 degrees. Above the 700 degrees, we cannot really call it a pyrolysis process because it's the the, the carbonization process, the, the the degradation of the biomass do not occur because everything is already degraded. 
so on the um, structure organization take place. Okay, uh, then we can divide the pyrolysis processes by the resistance times in the reactor of the biomass resistance times in the reactor. Uh, when the biomass resistance times is within hours, we call it slow pyrolysis. When it's a few minutes up to like, yeah, several minutes, we call it intermediate pyrolysis. And if it's very fast and the biomass uh, resistance times is, is, is counted in, in seconds, we call it fast pyrolysis. Why we divide them? We divide them because they differ differ in the average product yield. So for the fast pyrolysis, we obtain the, the liquids. The liquids are the, the most abundant product from the process. And, and then uh, for the intermediate and slow pyrolysis, we see the reduction in the yield of the liquids uh, and the increase in the yields of the solids and gases. And in the terms of the biochar production, we will be mostly interested in intermediate pyrolysis because um, even though that yield is some usually usually higher than in, than in the slow pyro, in the slow pyrolysis, the production time is much much shorter than than in, com in comparison to slow pyrolysis. All right. So how this process looks like in the terms of the industrial? Oh no, first. Um, let's Id identify the scale uh, where the process takes place, so the, the pyrolysis process takes place. If we will go uh, from the larger to the smaller scale, so we will, let's say, process the tree, yes, then we have a chunk of the tree. Uh, then if we would look on it uh, through the microscope, electronic microscope, we can, we can see it it's have kind of macrostructure. If we will um, enlarge it uh, 100 times, then we are able to see uh, the plant cell walls. And then further on magnification will show us the microstructure uh, of the plant, plant cell walls, uh, which is built from the biopolymers. And these compounds really uh, degradate during the process. And these are the cause of, of changing of the whole parameters of the biomass during the process. So typically, typically um, biomass is built, the major, the major components uh, of the structure are, are cellulose uh, and hemicellulose and lignin. The cellulose is, is in the form of this long, long fibrils, uh, which are decorated usually by the side chains of the hemicellulose, and the lignin polymer is a kind of, don't have really specified structure, it's like a glue uh, of the cellulose and hemicellulose um, biopolymers. So what happens with them? So these are the, these are the bio components. Uh, and then if we will treat them, uh, in the thermochemical thermochemical conversion thermochemical conversion process, so between 300 and 700 degrees, we will see the cracking uh, of the chains between the polymers and evolution of less weight molecular compounds. Yes, and also the biochar, which is like some parts goes into the these light, um, these light volatiles, and part of the carbon, part of the material, initial materials stays as a, as a solid residue, so biochar. Uh, the important thing is that if we will increase the temperature and the resistance times sufficiently long, yes, we will also obtain some secondary product, secondary carbon ashes product, which is soot, which usually is combined with the biochar because it's very hard to distinguish between both of them. Yes. So this is the real time degradation of the biopolymers. This is a thin film of, of the wooden structure. Uh, and here in the left top corner, you will see the temperature of the process. Yes. As you can see, the structures change uh, significantly and the, the mass that was released, it goes into the volatiles and whatever, what's, what stays, it's in 500 degrees, what, what's left is a, is a biochar, which has kind of similar, 
but also a bit different structure uh, than initial biomass. So, uh, in terms of the larger scale processing, how we, how we are doing it? So we start from the feedstock. Mm, the, right now, the the whole focus on the production of the biomass is driven to use not valuable biomass source like. Mm, wood which can be used uh, as a building material but some kind of residual material which is a cheap uh, which is cheap in the cost which is uh, which have low costs so in, in case of the of the forestry uh, we have like uh, forest residue which can be used as a, as a biofeedstock from the agriculture from the agriculture the crop residue and from the food industry let's say brewery residues brewery spent grains which uh, all are bio waste uh, and can be cheaply obtained and used as, as, as a feedstock for the production of the biochar. Then <clears throat> this feedstock is um, processed in this, in, this, in this particular scheme in the auger reactor. So firstly, uh, biomass is, is fed through the feeding system into the dryer. And in here we remove excess of the water, uh, which is kind of ballast and is not needed for further processing. Uh, then, uh, then the biomass goes into the main reactor, so the torrefaction pyrolysis reactor, when this biodegradation really takes place, the, the conversion of the biopolymers, the biomass itself. And this produces uh, volatiles, so the gases, they go through the cyclone and through the condenser, and non-condensable gases are treated as the pyrolysis gases, and the condensables from the condenser are called bio-oils. Yes, we can also, the, further on, the residues go through the color, uh, and in this way we obtain the biochar. Why we go through the color? Because if the, if the biochar would be released from the reactor in, let's say, 500 degrees, it will immediately oxidize. So we need, a, we need this, this cooling part on the end. Okay, this is how it looks how how this this is how it looks in the industry so we know how we can produce biochar it seems like it's not that hard it's not very complicated process um so what we can really for what we can really use the biochar uh, i divided this application by the novelty so we have the like least novel application of the biochar or the carbonaceous residual material from the biomass, which, has the, which are the energy production, like on the barbecue, let's say. Uh, synthesis gas production, so if we will gasify the biochar in, in the gasification process. And we can also use the biochar as a reduction agent in the, uh, in the metallurgy. So this, this um, uses most relies on the elemental composition of the biochar, nothing else. Then we have more novel applications, the, so, the uh, application of the biochar as a soil amendment, uh, as a heavy metals uh, immobilization agents in the soils, and as a pollutant absorber, uh, uh, absorber in the water treatment facilities or in, in the, uh, as treatment of the flue gases from kind of processes. And then we go to the most novel processes uh, most novel applications. So use biochar as a catalyst or catalyst carrier as a material for supercapacitors and for the batteries. So the last ones we all hear about, but we never saw it in the use. Uh, in, in, we never seen the use on, on the industrial scale, the biochar in those applications. Uh, the question is, uh, on which parameters depends its application? So there is variety of the parameters uh, which the biochar has. And for, as I mentioned, for this um, least novel applications, it's the heating value, carbon content. But if we will go to the right, uh, we are more um, concerned about, about um, pore size distribution, grinding ability and the hardness, uh, bulgan apparent density, resistivity and the conductivity, and the internal uh, surface functionalization. So these are, these are the parameters that are not that easy to measure and their change during the process is hard to grasp, really. Uh, 
I will focus more ab about pore size distribution because it's it's really relevant for this uh, use of the biochar in the so as a soil amendment, heavy metals absorption agent, and all of these more on the right. Yes. So let's. Firstly, divide the pore size which are inside of the internal, which are as internal structure of the of the of the biochar. So we can divide the pores by their size, and according to to the UEPAC, we have a micropores, which are the larger than 50 nanometers mesopores, which are between 50 and 2 nanometers, and the micropores, the smaller pores between 2 and 0 0.1 nanometers. Lower than that, we don't really can measure the pores because the compounds which measures the pores have this diameter, so we cannot really go further than that. Um, and the related influence of the pores, so for the micropores, the, uh, uh, these are related to the uh, plant av uh, available water, and as also they are give a habitat for the bacteria and, and fungi. So in the case of the soil application, uh, this can have kind of relevance, but in the use uh, as a, in, in the use of the biochar in in the chemical industry, industry let's say, or, or the production uh, facilities, we are more important into the, in, in its chemical sor sorption um, abilities. So in this case, we are focusing more on the mesopores and the micropores inside of the structure, yes? If we would like to qualitatively see how they look like for the micropores, we can use the, the Normal, normal, normal microscope or, or um, scanning electrode microscope. But if we would like to assess uh, mesopores and micropores uh, in detail, uh, we will need to go into the TEM. So this is transmission electron microscopy, especially in the, in the further region, we will have to use the high resolution TEM. And if we would like to quantitatively assess um, the structure. Uh, helium pyknometry can can allow uh, allow allow us to to assess um, the whole uh, pore volumes, but it's do not distinguish by the size. So for that for that one for that one, if we would like to dis distinguish how many each uh, pore size we have, so the pore size distribution in terms of the macropores, uh, it's advised to use the uh, mercury porosimetry. In the case of the mesopores, it's usually the nitrogen sorption. And for the micropores, the most reliable method, method is uh, carbon dioxide sorption. Um, everything's nice, yeah, but what that really tell us, how it look like? If we will see the, <coughs> if we will look, <coughs> Uh, on the let's say macro structure uh, of the wood biochar with the size of the hundred micro micrometers, uh, we see it's 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 have kind of channels itself. If we would enlarge this green rectangle by ten times, uh, we can see the structure more de in more detail, and if we will in magnified it 10 times, we are more or less in the range where the fungi lives. Below that, we cannot really find any fungi. If we would enlarge this red rectangle by the 300 times to the resolution of 300 nanometers, this is how the stru structure look like where bacteria grows. Below that, it's hard to find really the bacteria. In case of this blue rectangle, yes, and if we will magnify it 200 times uh, to the resolution of 500 nanometers, this is the lowest point from which plants can sort the water from the structure of the biochar. So the, the water sorption will depend on this structure, not lower than that. And the final enlargement of the orange rectangle. Uh, so from the 200, we magnified it 
25 times more, which gives us 50,000 uh, enlargement between the first and the last picture. And this is the structure on which hemisorption takes place. To comparison, uh, the kinetic diameter of the benzene is 0 0.58, 8, uh, 0 0.58. 585 nanometers and the nitrogen 0 0.364 nanometers and in case of the assessment of the smaller pores if we will see on this yellow rectangle these are the pores that that, that are assessed uh, by these compounds that would mean that uh, five let's let's say let's say five benzene compounds can enter this small channel within the three nanometers so in, in case of the working, in case of uh, trying to adjust um, the nanostructure in the biochar, which is important for the chemical adsorption, we are working in a um, very hard environment, which is really hard to understand at the moment because of, um, of its size. So we cannot it's kind of tricky uh, to make some kind of assessments and, 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 try to, and try to steer the process in a way that, that we will make some kind of, uh, build some kind of structure that further on will be related to, to the chemisorption of specific compounds with, with specific diameter. All right, so we know that we have a pyrolytic biochar which have novel, uh, novel application in agriculture, uh, chemistry, uh, and, uh, and electronics. We know what the feedstock is. The processing, uh, the, the process uh, of production of the biochar didn't seem that hard. So what is the problem right now? Why we cannot really obtain this, this uh, the biochar tailor made for the final solution. As I mentioned, um, or maybe not, maybe I haven't mentioned it yet. The biomass um, feedstocks uh, are very inhomogeneous. So they, they differ between themselves and the composition structure uh, very strongly. So that's kind of um, give, give, us, give, us, give us a problem in the, in the final a prediction of the product from the process as also the mechanism of the changes is not that well uh, discovered yet and what does that mean that we are not really sure uh, everything we don't know everything about the chemistry of the process we don't know everything about the changing of the structure especially the smaller structure so it can be concluded that we lack of knowledge uh, in the in the producing process, in, in the fundamental in the fundamentals of the of the of the production process, we can treat it as a bulk, but we cannot treat it as a uh, as a very refined material. So that really hinders us uh, from production uh, from application of the biochar in those novel solutions. So. As we can see, the biggest problem right now is not the techno it's not the technology uh, for the biochar production because it's it's well known and it's quite easy, but we don't really understand what happens. And this is why we cannot have nice things really, because we don't really understand uh, the whole process. So let's go to the modeling. Okay, uh, yes, so what we can do with that? Um, so what we can do to fill the gap, uh, the existing knowledge gap, uh, and be able to produce the biochar for the, these novel solutions? If we will treat um, the bridging the gap as a project, well, let's say the building installation, we, we, we want to build an installation, uh, and we would like to know what's going to be the outcome of the process. So we would like to treat some kind of biomass in some kind of process. We would like to know what's going to be on the end and 
to be able to assure the, its final quality all the time. So if we will see this project um, as a normal as a normal project without simulation involved, this is how the curve would look like. Uh, so the project will start from the the highest amount of uh, the highest number of changes in the projects, and then with the time it will reduce till the end of the project when everything will be settled and the project would end it. But in case if we will incorporate simulations into this project, the curves look kind of different. Uh, on the beginning of the project, we have more uh, changes that we are applying into the projects, then, then we have like significant drop. And uh, the project time is usually shorter uh, with simulation than without simulation. What this curves also told us, uh, told us something about the costs of the whole project. Uh, on the beginning, when we haven't, when we haven't built anything yet, uh, the, chain, the changes, let's say, uh, in the project itself are relatively easy. But by the, when the installation is already built, we cannot that easily apply the changes. Uh, they will take time and additionally, they will cost us much more. So this is the curve uh, for the cost of one change in the project. And we see on the graph that with the simulation, uh, in the time when the changes cost us the least, we have the, the most of the changes. And then uh, if the project, when the project is going to the end, we do not apply that many costly changes. So in, in summary, uh, with simulations, it seems that uh, the, the projects uh, are a bit shorter and the less expensive. So in terms of scientific approaching, uh, the scientific approach to bridging the gap, uh, we start from the point that we lack of knowledge. And in case if we would use only experimental um, methods uh, to bridge this gap, we will pay quite a lot. So we can imagine that we would like to process every kind of biomass that, that is available with every kind of composition that there is. That would give us a full knowledge, of course, yes. But it will cost us a lot and it will take a, a lot of time. But in case if we would apply the modeling and the experimental uh, and the experimental methods, yes, both of those will cost us a bit. But as we saw, uh, in terms of in in terms of of the of of, of finalizing the projects, that should give us uh, at least that that should give us uh, less costs and also reduce the time a bit. Uh, the modeling and experimental work was that means that mean that we obtain the matrix of the data which is sufficient to fit in the model for it to predict it on the broader range. Yes, so we can we don't have to really um, investigate all possibilities, but but only the most important ones on which we can make assumptions, which can be further on feed to the, to, to the model. Yes, and in both, both of those ways, uh, which allow us to bridge the gap, but the uh, less expensive one is modeling and experimental work. So right now I will say something about the basics so the basics terminology uh, which is used in, in the field. So the CFD, which is like uh, computa computational fluid dynamics is the analysis of the system involving fluid, involving fluid flow, heat transfer, and as associated phenomena like uh, chemical reaction by using computer-based simulations. In general, CFD uh, was developed to investigate the f flow and heat transfer, but further development allowed us to, to introduce the, the other, other segments to this, to this, whole, to this whole tool, mm, which, which broadened, the, broadened its application. Let's say like 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was quite hard to, to, to model the chemical reactions because the software and the hardware wasn't really prepared for that, but 
current days, uh, we already have a software which, a software and the hardware, which, which allow us for that. So what is the model? Uh, it's a mathematically described by the algorithms and equations, uh, representation of the system existing in real life. That means that through the model, so through these mathematical equations, we uh, try to describe something that's really happening, but the model always introduces some kind of error because we are never, we, we are never um, describe the process in the full way because of the randomness of what's happening in, in the real time processes. So uh, in that meaning, the, the, the models usually introduce also some kind of um, error related to it. What is the simulation? Simulation is an action. Uh, uh, is an action performed on, on a test model. So first thing we build the model and then we calculate different, uh, um, different scenarios on it. And each scenario which was calculated by the model is called the simulation. And numerical, because it's also uh, often the used term, uh, that means that uh, the, matic the mathematical model would be, trans uh, would be translated through the informatics into the numerical language known by the numerical to tool, so the computers, to perform uh, the computations. That, uh, in other words, the numerical means that if we put something in the in, in, in the way that we understand it as a human, yes, this uh, tools translated into the in, to translate this this information uh, in the in the computer language, so zero and ones, and then it can be treated by the processor uh, in, in the numerical tool. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Comprehensive modeling in the identification of the scale. Uh, when we are investing, when we would like to build a model of the biomass conversion, we can see the phenomena occurring on the different scales. Uh, as it was previously mentioned, the smaller scales are the micropolymers. The larger scale, the larger scale are, are, is the structure uh, of, of of the processed material itself. And the largest the largest scale of, of the biomass processing is the industrial scale, so in the in the reactor. And this is how the comprehensive model is divided on. So, starting from the model type, we start from the molecular models, uh, which in which considered size are biomass structure structural polymers. Um, this model, molecular models, covers uh, primary, uh, primary, uh, primary bipolymers degradation, secondary charting and secondary tar cracking, and it's uh, geometry independent. So we don't, we treat it as a bulk material without any dependent, dependent, dependent on, on, on dimensions. A uh, bit larger scale than that is a single particle. So the single particle of porous biomass. And it covers previous, uh, previous models, so the molecular model in terms of the reaction kinetics, also particle drying, internal heat and mass transport, uh, and internal structure change. So the structural changes which, which happens, uh, which, which take place uh, during the conversion. And this one is geometry dependent because the size of the particle which which is processes which is processed uh, is important and also the the structure of the wood itself uh, have different uh, different parameters in different in different directions so let's say in the longitudinal direction so along the grain it's it have different it has different properties than on the radial. If we will see the, the wood structure, then, then it's, it's quite, a, quite a, kind of obvious. And the larger scale, the reactor scale, the most tricky one, the most uh, comput computational burdening one. Uh, so it covers the, pyroly the pyrolysis reactor environment. And that means that, it's, that it covers the 
it covers behavior of this single particle in case if there is like in, in the reactor at the same time as a thousand particles, then the, each particle should be treated separately. So each particle have to be described separately and convert separately in this reactor scale. Uh, the reactor, uh, the reactor's fluid dynamics, so how the gases inside the reactors uh, behave, as well as the particle, um, particle wall, particle, uh, particle, and particle, inter particle gas uh, interactions, because they also can shift a bit the whole conversion of the single particle inside of the reactor, and it's also. Uh, geometric dependent, but this is uh, geometric dependent by the re the reactor structure, yes, not the bio not the biomass particle structure itself, but by the by the reactor uh, structure. And what kind of numerical approaches should be used to compute um, the models in these different scales? So for the molecular scale, we don't really need any kind of numerical tool because the amount of the data which is needs to be processed is relatively small because it don't depend on the geometry. So we don't need to really use any um, yeah, any any kind of any kind of uh, robust soft software for that. Uh, in terms of the single particle conversion, the most useful uh, numerical tools are, are covered by the computational fluid dynamics, so the CFD. Uh, and in the reactor scale, besides of the CFD, so the behavior of the fluids, we also need to take in account the behavior behavior of the particles, which is which is covered by uh, this distributed elements method. I think uh, that's the that's the short version. That's that's the yeah, that's the meaning of the DEM. Uh, and as it was mentioned in the topic of uh, this presentation we will mostly focus on the single particles. So what, what happens in terms of the, partially about in, uh, in the reaction kinetics, but more, more in the terms of the internal hidden mass transport and internal structure change. And to do that, we will need to understand a bit more uh, something about the, we will need to understand more uh, about the CFD. But first thing first, let's focus on the reaction kinetics, which are usually applied uh, in the single particle uh, conversion. So these are the biomass degradation schemes available in the literature, starting from the simplest ones, uh, which treats biomass as a one compound and the products as a gas star and char, which, which is which is which is kind of which is kind of very straightforward. Uh, these models are based on the Safide and Chins uh, uh, schemes, which was invented in 1978. It has primarily the three reactions. Uh, so the biomass into the primary char, to the bio oil, and to the primary gas, and takes cover four compounds. It's not very accurate model. It uh, gives only um, limited amount of, of information about the process and we cannot really do a lot with that. But uh, recently there was there were developed uh, more detailed uh, degradation schemes. So in which the biomass is treated treated as a as a mixture of the bio components and additionally ad additionally lignin uh, is, di is is divided in the, into the three artificial forms depending on its uh, on its structure. Uh, from the side of the products, we obtain the numerous volatile compounds. Uh, depending on depend that depends on the on the applied on the applied schemes, and uh, the char is not treated only as a elemental carbon, but also as a meta metaphase trap, which degradate with the with the processing temperature. That that means that we can. Uh, kind of model the biochar structure in the chemical way more accurately. Um, the first one, uh, the first detailed scheme was the uh, was invented by Professor Randy. Uh, it was in 2000, I think, 11. Uh, the most recent adjustment of its model done done by the Black, the Black G in 2008 uh, covers 25 reactions and 48 compounds. 
uh, of course, with the heat of the reaction, all the kinetic all the kinetic parameters related to that. But this model was developed for application in the fast pyrolysis to describe the, to describe the fast pyrolysis. That mean that's in in case if um, the compound retention in inside of the biochar structure is long is is enlonged is, is longer than 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 fast pyrolysis takes in count. The biomass do not predict the accurately the char yields because of the secondary secondary charring reaction and secondary tar cracking reaction uh, which produce the soot. And to Yeah, to improve the model a bit, uh, Dr. An uh, Ansa Corsa, I hope I pronounced it right, uh, in 2017, or uh, in 2014, I tried to, uh, try to adjust the Ramsey model in a way that it will more accurately uh, predict the products of intermediate, intermediate pyrolysis. Uh, it, his scheme uh, from 2017 contains 24 reactions and 33 compounds, so less compounds and additionally uh, in it in his scheme he added like five charring parameters which can be uh, adjusted this is not the best way to model stuff in the case if we have to uh, and prior to we have to uh, we have to adjust the parameters beforehand we need to adjust the parameters beforehand uh, uh, bef before we we the, the model should cover the model sh should should work separately uh, without any without any uh, intervention of uh, of the modeler in it so we cannot really adjust and we shouldn't really we shouldn't really be adjusting the the parameters inside of the scheme uh, every time we want to calculate something the model should work on the broad uh, on the broad on the broad range in that in that meaning that that the parameters should be settled in that uh, but this is this is um, this is the, the the kind of problem uh, with the knowledge of on the on the chemistry which which happens uh, which happens uh, um, during the process that we are not really sure uh, how to quantify quantify it in the way that it will be automatically incorporated into the process. All right, so we covered the chemistry. Let's go a step forward. So to the CFD modeling. Uh, how, what's how it works from where we start? Uh, what's really happening during the CFD process? So uh, firstly, um, in in the preprocessor, which can be like as a separate as a separate software uh, or as a similar as as the same software depends. Uh, depends uh, depends on the software. In case of the ANSYS preprocessor, uh, preprocessor is outside of the of, of the software, and then in case of the console, it's incorporated in it. But in the in the preprocessor, we create the geometry and we generate the mesh. Then this mesh uh, is a, is a foundation for incorporation of the solver which contains the governing equations so the mechanisms in which the change is gonna happen but it is supported by the physical model ex experimental data about the chemical reaction structural changes parameters and their dependencies because the governing equations are um, quite universal uh, universal so they can they can uh, describe most of the systems, but not in very detailed way. To go in more detail, we need to we need to adjust the model by ourselves by this physical model. Uh, and also in the solver, the, there are solver settings. Uh, so this is this is mo mostly the the area of the computer science. So the discretization method, solution method, initialization and time stepping, solution control. These are the things that that people from the computer science are working on. Uh, okay, so. If we have everything settled in the in, in the process, we solve 
we run it, obtain the model results, which is a simulation, and it goes to the post processor. So the information um, calculated by the governing equations and the mesh, because in the mesh, uh, the all information is stored. These are the, these these two things are, are, are processed by the post processor, and in uh, in in the post processor we can we can produce the the plots animations whatever we can extract the information from the from, from the process that we model. Yes, so okay, this is the CFD modeling CFD model. We want to model the single particle conversion. But prior to model it, we should think how it look like, what it's like, and what's the important stuff in there. So the single particle uh, pyrolysis takes place take place in the in the special kind of reactors, which are the single particle reactor, obviously. Um, uh, one of those is uh, in the Austria in Bioenergy 2020. Uh, this is the this is uh, this large um, box, the, the large cylinder on the left hand side is the reactor and the particle is looks relatively small to that. This is this is the raw this is the raw sample which is introduced in, into the into the reactor. From the bottom of the reactor there is a inner gas which flows uh, through the system and the walls of the reactor are heated up to the temperature that we wanted, and also through that, some kind of radiation is is is, is introduced in, 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 to the wall of the sample itself. Yes, so this is how the raw samples look like, and this is how the processes sample look like. But what happens in between? This is uh, the this is what we really want to model, and how it look like. are the, the real-time view of the process which happens in the in the reactor. Right now uh, the sample was covered by the water um, cooled blanket in order to prevent uh, the process starting too fast. Um, particles degradate obviously its surface getting charred and also we can see that uh, its dimension reduced so the particle shrinks. Right now, the surface temperature uh, achieving the start, starts to achieving the the temperature of the of the reactor. It shrinks even more, and sometimes it blows out due to the pressure. But more or less, this is what we gonna. This is what needs to be done. This is what needs to be modeled. Uh, by the CFD. So all of those things what happens on this video needs to be covered by the CFD model. We haven't seen a lot. We only see um, uh, geometrical change or the, or, the, or, or the color change of the particle, but what really ha happens inside, uh, we can measure that. It's a kind of, it, it's measured. We can, we can also uh, investigate that. And this is more or less what we are focusing at the moment. Okay, so let's start from the uh, creating the, the, the geometry. Um, <clears throat> uh, the most uh, known biomass is the wood, so it's going to be uh, the, sim the simplest material to, to model, um, and it's not between the between the between the if we will obtain the cylinders from the same tree the composition of the biomass shouldn't be that uh, that different so it's kind of homogeneous and we can rely on that but the wood have uh, two um, crucial dimensions longitudinal and the radial in which it has um, different properties in terms of the permeability or the thermal conductivity In the literature, we can find that 
few years back, people modeled the biomass, con the, the single particle conversion in the terms of the 1D. So if we apply the 1D, uh, 1D model, one dimensional model, uh, we need to apply also some averaging because we cannot uh, stick to the original measured parameters because there is no, there is no dimensions to, to, to constrain, to link, to link the, the parameters to them. And the whole model is represented as a line. So that also, that also uh, the, the whole approach leads to, to some kind of errors, uh, uh, errors, um, er errors result, uh, results from that. But uh, we can also, we can also, we can also model, we, we can also model uh, the geometry as a two dimensional or three dimensional, three dimensional, uh, in which we can link the, the dimension dependent parameters to the dimension and apply also the real values. So the values which are measured, which are, which are, which, which, which were measured before. Uh, so that that should give us a more accurate result on the end. The question is, if we do we need two D or do we need three D? Because at every additional at the, uh, every additional dimension introduce um, and introduce um, introduce some computational burden to the system. So. The simpler, the if the model the the the, the least dimension the, 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 the dimension the best, but also we cannot go too low uh, in order to keep the the system real that that we want to model. So if we have like actual wooden cylinder, mm -hmm. we can create the three D geometry of it. Yes, so, so the, the, the 3D geometry representation of the wooden cylinder. But we can see that uh, there is some symmetry axis along, uh, along the symmetry axis. So, and if we had considered the, 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 the dimension dependencies, the most important, uh, the most important uh, dimensions is long, the directions is longitudinal and radial and the tangential, so more or less. Yeah. In the, in the, in the tangential, in the tangential, in the tangential uh, direction, the parameters are more or less uh, the same as in the radial. That would mean that we will do not introduce too much error if we will simplify this 3D, 3D model, 3D cylinder as a 2D, uh, 2D axis, uh, 2D axis, 2D axis model. So that's that's mean that the model is axis symmetrical, yes, along along the along the symmetry axis. axis. So if we would like um, turn around or around turn this rectangle uh, around the symmetry axis, we will also get, get cylinder. And that's really simplify the amount of the information that is stored by the geometry and also geometry itself. So if we already obtain the geometry, then we go to the mesh generation. And a few words about the meshing itself. Um, this is the domain that we obtain in the, in we made the, the, the domain in the geometrical domain, but um, let me just for CFD purpose, this domain needs to be divided into a finite number of smaller non-overlapping subdomains called cells, uh, and this division give us uh, give us a mesh. And the whole process is called meshing, of course. Uh, and these grids have to occupy all the main that we would like to calculate. So through the meshing and the uh, finite volume method. So um, then we obtain then we obtain the grid, so which is equal equal to the mesh. <clears throat> and this is more or less the structure on which the CFD model will will work. This is the one cell. Uh, if we would uh, 
enlarge uh, this um, blue rectangle. Yes. Uh, we are able to notice um, something that is uh, very important, that every cell contains a node in which the all information is stored. Yes, and the information it's stored in the node changes accordingly to applied governing equations. Yes, so this is the node n uh, in the place x, y, and in the time t, and it contains, let's say, the model only calculates temp temperature and pressure, so it contains only two parameters. This is also kind of important that every cell have finite volume V, which do not change. It's, it is kind of constant. Uh, if we mesh, if we make more uh, fine mesh, then the volume of each cell is smaller, but still every volume of the cell during the, during the computation do not change, yes? So that's it. The exception is, of course, the shrinking. Yeah, if 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 the if we apply the shrinking, then the definitely volume of of the of this of the cells have to have to change. But usually, usually for the in the beginning, um, we don't we don't really introduce the the shrinking, which because it's a quite of uh, complex in terms of the numerical solution and application. Yes. Um, so imagine the computational scheme as it was, it was, it was said previously, uh, the, the governing equations are embedded in the mesh. So they're working honestly on the mesh. So the, the delta Y and delta X, so the derivative of the, of the Y and, and, and the, the derivative of the X more or less is are dependent on the coarseness uh, of the mesh. If uh, if they are smaller, this delta y this delta y is getting smaller, and this delta x is getting smaller, and it's incorporated into computation. So on how the mesh is constructed uh, is also related to the computation itself. It's it's not something separate. Uh, sometimes uh, in, in for some some kind of process processes or the conditions, the mesh needs to be finer, and for so, some others, the mesh can be, can be just um, coarse, uh, which allows for the very quick computation purposes. If we would, to this two dimension, if we would add the third, di third dimension, the time, we can also see that um, the, whole, um, the whole structure, um, the whole, the whole computation is 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 is, is kind of um, it's kind of Cartesian, yeah. Uh, in the in the way that that we we are uh, within within a certain within a certain time, yes, uh, we have two D dimension, but we can move along the, the x along the along the time axis, and by the time step, yes, uh, we are moving further on. Yes. Uh, this is a kind of visualization that I would like to, that I, I, I like to show you to, to give you a grasp of uh, of the of the time of the process. Yes. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the governing equation quite quickly. Um, and the Biomass con conversion, um, in general, governing equations covers the mass, momentum, and, and energy. So in the terms, in the terms of, of, of uh, application of governing, equation, uh, governing equations in the biomass conversion, we divide the mass uh, governing equations on, into the solid and into the fluid. Uh, the black things we cannot really change. Uh, these are the computed ones. And this one we apply into the model. This is a source term in terms of the mass. Um, in the case of the momentum, we only take uh, in count the fluid <clears throat> because the solid do not move. 
Um, and here uh, we use the Darcy equation because uh, of the very um, low permeability, per permeability of the gases in the structure. And we have also the energy equation, uh, which, is, which consists of uh, different parts like accumulation, convection, conduction, and the source. Um, the blue ones we, we have to introduce into the model prior to the computation because the model needs them uh, because the model needs them um, to to work really yes and these governing equations are related to the geometry nodes so the, the nodes that are not on the surface of our domain uh, these are the this, this one which are on the surface domain are the boundary nodes and they are defined a bit differently, but on them depends the whole computation because they they really drive the process uh, into the drive. They really drive the process. Um, in terms of the solids, uh, we don't have uh, removal of of solid compounds from the surface. In terms of the flu in terms of the fluids, um, the release of the compounds is um, dependent on. Uh -huh, this is also the on the density uh, on the concentration outside outside of the boundary and the conduction uh, and the convection um, convection mass transfer uh, parameter in case of the momentum um, the boundary is usually the pressure in case of the typical pyrolysis is one atmosphere and in the terms of the energy uh, the heat from the surface is, re is released on is released from the through the conduction of the solids, uh, and it's taken out by the or introduced into the into the system by the convection. So the the gases that flows on the boundary and also through the radiation of the wall. Let's say it's of, of the reactor wall. It's usually above the 500 degrees when this radiation part starts to be relevant. Okay, speed up. Okay. Um, okay, Paramet parameters does this to be defined. This is the list. Mm, quite a lot of things related to the solid and, and char needs to be defined uh, as initial parameters. Uh, in terms of the gas compounds also as well. Um, some of the parameters can be introduced as a parameter. Some of them are the correlations uh, with the temperature, with the concentration, with different things that changes during during the process. So these are the fundamental. Um, we can divide them by the fundamental. So this one that 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 are globally valid. So let's say the kinetics, gas density, pressure. It's usually this is how we calculate them. And in terms of the experimental, these are the strongly related to the system that we are describing. So in case if it's a beech wood, it's a beech wood. In case if it's a pine wood, it's a pine wood, and these values can change. Yes, these, these are the dependent, these are dependent on the actual process that we, that we model. Um, few words about the wood in homogeneity. Uh, there is a there is a there is a quite a difference um, in, in the True density. So um, this this one is, is is dependent on the biocomposition. So as you can see, that softwood and the hardwood can differ very strongly in the case of the true density parameters that we, that we apply initially. Also, um, there is quite a wide range of the thermal conductivity that can be applied in in, uh, in radial and longitudinal direction. The other the other parameter that it's uh, that it's important for the whole process and and the its its parameters are, are not very homogeneous is uh, wood permeability which differs in the longitudinal and radial direction as was mentioned before and each kind of wood structure has different permeability also in case there is a difference if um, the wood is from the middle of the tree or from the closer to the bark because it's uh, subwood and hardwood. And also there is a kind of difference uh, if the wood grows in different environment. Yeah, let's say this, this one is the, the Douglas fir, which, which was grown in the mountains and this one which was grown by the, 
by the sea, so the permeability is kind of different. Uh, that's um, that's kind of important information because we need to apply the parameters that are closest to the um, to the situation that we want to model. Because in other case we can we can uh, introduce very strong error into the system. Yes, okay, solver and solver settings. Yes, um, this is a kind of um, Mm. If we will, if we will uh, put into the consideration um, what happens in the node, in the one node after the the after the temperature increase. So during the time step of the of the solution, temperature increase in, increased. Yes, but let's say by the five degrees. That leads us to the increase in the kinetic decomposition. So that increases the gas release. That increases the gas density. That increases the pressure. The pressure increasing increase the gas velocity, and that uh, increases the uh, convective transport. Uh, as well, the temperature increase decrease the gas velocity, which also have influence on the gas viscosity, which also have influence on the gas velocity, uh, which also have uh, influence on the convective transport. The composition, as we saw uh, on the movie, change the pore size. Yes. And that changes gas permeability of the structure, and that's have dependence on the gas velocity. Uh, the composition of the kinetics uh, changes the ratio between bi biomass and char, so the biomass to char decreases. That reduces the thermal conductivity of the solid, but <laughs> and as as well as well increase increase the reaction heat consumption because this is the composition. So usually the heat is consumed in the, in the process. Uh, temperature, the temperature and the larger pore size uh, increase the radiative, uh, radiative conductive, conductive, conductivity inside of the particle, and increase of the temperature increase the heat capacity. Yes, so hard to guess really what if will temperature rise in the next time step or not. Uh, if we would like to do it in in this manner uh, for let's say 100 nodes, we will end up like that. Yes, but since we are using since we are using computational software, yes, we uh, we give it to it and it will do it for us. So, long story short. Uh, this different different parts of the equation. So the accumulation. Uh, and, and source terms for the solid mass gas uh, gas and heat yes they are um, they are computing what happened inside of the node uh, which is uh, not really connected um, to the other nodes yes but we have also the conve uh, convection uh, co uh, convection which is kind of exchange between the between the nodes so if we have like source or sink of kind of heat or mass uh, uh, rather not single of the mass, uh, single of the heat, yes, uh, and accumulated and accumulated um, heat is not enough. The the heat is taken from the um, neighboring 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 node. So this is more or less it kind of puts the balance of the whole system. That something is produced within the node, and if it's something is too much or too little, yes, it's taken from the other nodes. And everything is driven by the by the boundary conditions that was applied in, in prior. Yes. Okay. Enough with the solver. Enough. Uh, this this will take more than uh, it will take a long time to, to explain all of those. Um, okay. We had a model. It was established. We calculated. It converts. Uh, everything looks nice. We got the results. Then we go to the post processor. So if we would like to see how the temperature inside of the of the particles changes, we can easily see that. There is also changes of the pressure inside of the particle during the process. If we are interested in gas velocity, there is a very a lot of a lot of different a lot of different options that, that we can investigate, that we can see really. Uh, in terms of the animations, they are very nice to make a point, but not very useful in terms if we would like to extract some kind of information from it. It's it's kind of qualitatively assessment, not not quantitative assessment. So they are nice, but not that useful. 
and more useful are the plots, yes, uh, which are usually don't look that, that colorful, but they're more more useful. Um, so let's 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 have few exam uh, examples. So the temperature change in the different points, yes, uh, the global mass loss, yes or the flux of the compounds groups, uh, groups uh, from the surface. The first one can give us information how long it takes to, co to convert the wooden cylinder, yes? Because if the temperature inside reaches the temperature of the, of the outside, then that doesn't mean the process is finished, usually. Uh, in the global mass loss, we can find out um, how the mass is changing and What's going to be the final <clears throat> and what's going to be the final uh, final biochar yield from the process and in in the in the flux uh, of the compounds, we can assess when, which, and how much compounds is released. Yes, which it's kind of useful information in terms of the quantification of the bio oil is produced from the process. Um, so, what is the most reliable uh, method uh, to check if model is right? Because yes, we build the model. We put all the experimental data into it. Uh, we connected it nicely, it converged, it's calculated. We have nice graphs, we have nice plots, we have nice animations. But how we are sure if that works, um, if it's real, yes? If the model predicts something that is real, yes? Um, there, is, there, is, there is an option to check that, yes? Uh, so we need to validate it with. Uh, experimental data or validated with exper experimental data. There, honestly, there is no other way uh, to prove that model is reliable and it works properly and it agrees with uh, uh, with the experimental process. Yes. So in that case, all the models prior to 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 make investigation on them need to be they need to be validated. So. The model which I created yeah, was, let's say, um, let's say validated with experimental with experimental data. So that that means that this line is close to the to the points, yes. And the clo the closer it is, the better the the validation is. The more accurate the model is. Um, the one thing that that is kind of important that model should be useful not only for one certain type. Of parameter or the one certain time of the produce, production conditions. Uh, that would mean that the, the, the more validation data sets, the better. Yes. So so let's so so the model should be also validated not only by the simple like temperature or, or the mass loss, but also by the evolution of the evolution of the compounds that will give us information about the chemistry of the process and not also chemistry of the of, of the interaction between the chemistry and the structure. Yes. And also if we will validate the model in, in different temperature conditions, that will give us a hint if the model covers it fully. Yes. Okay, so where that kind of um, where that kind of uh, data can be obtained? Uh, it's through the experimental work on the single particle reactor, like the one I showed you from the Bioenergy 2020. Um, this setup gave uh, validation data, uh, quite abundant validation data. So the temperature of the center, temperature of the surface, mass loss. Also, it gave us a uh, also gave um, it gave gave it gave a gas composition and also partial tar composition, but on this one we could also obtain the biochar particles and do some kind of secondary analysis, which can be further on incorporated into the model to expand it to make it more accurate in that manner, uh, and also investigate investigate the some kind of real process yes so 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 kind of real parameter change. And then incorporate it into the back into the model, yes, to find out if we can model that in the real way, and if it's if, if it's kind of accurate. So that's that's by that by the end of the day would would let's say fill the the knowledge gap uh, that we are aiming for. So in in conclusion, in summary. Biochar can be useful material, uh, also in the novel application, but we still don't know how to get there, how to produce it uh, in the uh, to produce the tailor-made biochar. Uh, 
modeling and simulations can be a part of the solutions, which 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 can increase the uh, the whole development, uh, the pace of the whole development. Uh, to model structure parameters, the single uh, particle model have to be applied, so the, C the CFD have to be involved in that. Uh, very casual caution is strongly advised in the construction of the model. In terms of the applied parameters, uh, also in, in case uh, of the how we connect, how we how we in interconnect the model itself, and it's better to be cautious in, in that because uh, sometimes we can put something into the model that we don't really understand how it works and that can destroy the whole model. Um, so the model is uh, as useful as, as it fits to the experimental validation data and only more or less within that range can be used. So we can, we can, we can, validate, it, we can validate the model within a certain range yes, and only investigate uh, its, uh, its results on the certain range. No further than that because then we don't really know if, if something else didn't change in the way that we uh, didn't uh, anticipate and it's not very close to the real situation. Yes, thank you very much for your attention. I hope I didn't kill you and I didn't bore you to death. Whew, that was quite the right. Uh, this is my email. So if somebody has any kind of question, let me know. I can also provide you uh, publications related to the subject if you're interested in. And one thing uh, as well, I would like to invite, invite you all to the Pyro conference, uh, which will take uh, place in the May 2020, upcoming year, and here in Ghent. Uh, the clock is ticking uh, because the call for abstract is still the middle of the January. Of course, it's going to be extended till the beginning of the February, but still take in mind that the deadline for the, for the abstract submission is coming. Thank you again. I'm sorry that it took so long.